Um, my name is Mark Watson. I know I've met a few of you already. Um, for those that, that don't know me, um, I'm a senior research manager at IHS. I work in the technology division uh, within the industrial automation team. Um, we focus on a lot of automation products. I focus on discrete automation, which also includes the embedded computer boards, modules, and systems. Um, my colleague, Toby Cahoon, um, presented at this event last year. Um, and I'm hoping to provide a bit of an update to some of the stuff that he talked about with you, um, focusing on some of the um, key markets that, um, that you guys are potentially going to be selling into. So the first of those that I wanted to, to spend some time looking at, which is the one I know most about, um, is the industrial automation market. Um, so this chart um, presents five indices, everything at the bottom level, uh, real GDP, um, to industrial production, machinery production, capital expenditure, and finally at the top level, the IAE index, which is industrial automation equipment and sales of those products. So we can see in 2009, obviously, there was the big drop with the recession, the recovery for two years, 10 and 11. And then things kind of stabled out a little bit, 12, 13, and 14. Um, also for last year, uh, with the exception being capital expenditure. Um, so capital expenditure as a whole, we estimate to be in the region of $3.7 trillion. Um, now, a big proportion of that, about 60%, goes on things like land and buildings. Uh, a very small percent goes direct to end users in terms of the equipment they're purchasing. And the other third is really on machinery itself um, and automation components. So the drop that we saw last year was really driven by commodities, the, the collapse in, in some prices, uh, metals, mining. Uh, obviously, what we've seen going on with the oil and gas industry, um, prices continue to decline. Um, I think today Brent is trading at less than $28 a barrel. Some analysts are talking about that getting down towards $10 or $15 a barrel. That's really driven a huge amount of um, change in the industry. A lot of exploration product, uh, projects, multi-billion dollar projects have either been canned altogether or postponed. But we are seeing some investments still in terms of automation. So obviously the margins of, of these companies have been squeezed massively. And the same is happening in mining and metals. And those companies are turning to, in some instances, automation components and products to try and improve efficiencies, uh, reduce costs, um, and overall improve their margin at, at this difficult time. So there is still investment, um, but, but not in such the, the big projects that we might have been used to over the last few years. You'll see that there is an uptick in 16 and 17 for capital expenditure. Um, IHS is forecasting that the oil price will start to recover. Um, the latest information that I've got from our team in the, in, the energy, um, in the energy world is still forecasting that in 2017 that the price will be back up to around $60 a barrel. Um, how, how we see that changing, um, obviously that's, that's something that's going on at the moment. So to take the, the slice that is specifically on industrial automation, so of the $3.7 trillion of capex, around $176 billion is, is direct on automation equipment. And you can see in the, the blue boxes there, um, that's made up of everything from motors to controllers, rotary products, linear products, switch gear. Um, and generally, we see all of those markets continuing to grow. Um, companies within, um, whether machine builders, end users, they are looking, again, to improve efficiencies, improve quality, um, reduce downtime. And this is something that, that we talk about a lot. Um, in the US, it's typically called advanced manufacturing or smart manufacturing. In, in Europe and Germany, it's uh, Industry 4.0. Um, China has their own variant, the Made in China 2025. Japan has its own variant. And all of this is, is around developing new technologies within industrial automation. And something that, that Jerry talked about that was important at CES, um, IoT. Um, and we see the industrial internet of things, um, driving connectivity of machinery and devices, helping manufacturers better understand processes um, to improve decision making, reduce downtime. That really is going to be a key driver in the market over the next few years. 
and is taking some of these manufacturers away from the traditional hardware markets. You know, if it's a PLC or an industrial PC, these companies are now really starting to look at how they can support that with software and services and develop new revenue streams with new business, uh, with new business models. From a regional perspective, um, you can see there that the Americas um, growth was down last year. Similar story for EMEA um, and Japan. All of those regions have been hit hard. Um, we still are seeing um, the impact um, of commodity prices, the, the markets, exchange rate changes, which are all having a negative impact. Um, and China in particular is, is also pulling down a lot of the developing regions in the world. Um, EMEA was really pulled down by uh, the sanctions in Russia. Um, we saw a decline there, and we're expecting another decline in terms of GDP this year, um, and also the slow growth that we're seeing in countries like Italy, Spain, Portugal, and even, and even France. So to pull out some of the process markets in particular and show their relative sizes, um, power is, is the biggest. Um, and this is really being driven by changing demographics in the world, um, particularly in developing regions, countries looking to, to get new um, power into the grid um, to develop new generation. Um, and in developed countries also looking at renewable technology, um, greener ways of, of powering um, the economy. Oil and gas we've talked about already, and although the, the investment in that industry has declined significantly due to the oil price, there is still um, some opportunity in that market, as we've talked about more automation being used in existing um, plants and refineries. Some of the um, industries related to consumer, like food and beverage and packaging, continue to do relatively well, although not necessarily at the levels that we've been used to seeing. Um, legislation is helping to drive some of that with tracking and tracing of production, um, being able to, to better manage that process, um, and that's affecting things like pharma industry as well um, with tight regulation, and we're seeing that even introduced in countries like China, um, given recent events and things that have happened over there. Again, some of the, the industries like mining and metals where commodity prices have declined significantly, we are seeing those, those industries looking to um, invest in new technology in this time to help them come out of that and be stronger when things do pick up. I just wanted to pick out the, the food and beverage industry um, and also the packaging machinery sector. Um, this has really been one of those where we've seen extremely strong growth um, in, in the last few years. Um, and we are starting to see that slow down now. And, and part of that is really driven by population growth and that's stagnating in, in developed regions. Um, elderly um, generations, um, people getting older in you know, the US, the UK, Germany, um, and that growth of machinery isn't being offset by what we're seeing in developing regions like China. Um, also following the recession in 2009, there was a huge amount of investment in new machinery, in new automation. Um, and that's really now resulted in a huge overcapacity in, in a lot of industries, particularly in China, um, which is dampening demand at the moment for new machinery and, and some automation. So just to summarize, um, the, the key challenges for the industry at the moment, um, certainly the collapse in commodity prices, uh, overcapacity in certain industries and regions, we still see um, stock market corrections. Um, we've seen that recently in China with their new circuit breaker uh, kicking in at least twice um, as, as the, the market went down. And the China slowdown, it still remains a huge question mark over investment. Um, there's a lot of uncertainty. Um, some people still talking about a hard landing for, the, uh, the, for China. Um, and that would be if growth of their GDP fell below about 5%. So anything below that would likely trigger um, a, a global recession. Um, we don't see that as a huge risk at the moment, but there still is a huge amount of uncertainty out there. And one of the challenges, as well as an opportunity, is, is digitalization of, of production. So this is the, the use of IoT um, and new technology to improve processes. But how to do that is a huge question mark for, for industry. Things typically move very slowly um, in, in industrial automation. 
Um, even today, the use of wireless for communication represents less than 5% of connected devices. Ethernet is probably 25 to 30%. The remaining connectivity is, is all still done by legacy field bus systems. So change is, is happening, but we're probably seeing Ethernet gain maybe 1% per year in terms of new node connections. It, it's very slow. And something as big as, as using IoT, you know, the questions around who manages that, um, the IT versus OT question mark, how data is, is analyzed, who owns that data, how secure is that data are all massive question marks for the industry. On the opportunities side, um, we have robotics, um, whether that's industrial robots or service robots, um, a huge opportunity particularly for companies like Foxconn um, looking to improve quality of products, reduce labor costs. We still see some of the high-tech sectors continue to perform pretty well. Um, semiconductors, um, automotive as well, tend to be the industries that lead adoption of new technology um, and a, a barometer for some of the other sectors. They continue to perform okay, um, so that could be a, a good sign for some of the other industries that are, are closely related to those. And as I've talked about, smart manufacturing um, and decentralized intelligence to enable smart manufacturing. Uh, there needs to be a lot more intelligence out in the field, um, not just centralized, but out. Um, if you have a, a refinery, um, an oil rig, being able to monitor and better track processes, um, often remotely, um, will give people much better understanding of what's going on uh, and to make improvements where necessary. So to move on to um, defense, so the, the next few slides that I'll show are all pulled from IHS Janes, um, so our colleagues who, who spend a lot of time analyzing defense spend uh, and the, the, the trends that are impacting that market. So this is a 20-year profile of US defense spend. Um, the CAGR, the, the compound growth rate over the whole period is around 3.5%. Um, However, from today, looking out over the next five years, that's probably around 1.5%. So long term, there's still uh, obviously good growth opportunity here, but certainly in the shorter term, it's, it's a bit more subdued. Um, and that's really been driven by the overseas proportion of that spend. So the, the blue bar at the bottom is the, the base budget. That's everything from procurement to personnel, uh, research and development. The, the orange bar at the top is the, the overseas spend, and you can see that that peaked 2008, 9, 10, 11 with Iraq and Afghanistan, and ever, ever since has declined year on year. Um, so although base budget has a, has a pretty good CAGR of 2.5%, for OCO that's um, negative 10% over the period. It is still important to note, I think, in, in terms of the magnitude of US defense spend, if you compare the top 10 countries the US um, as number one versus the other nine, the US still exceeds the other nine combined in terms of def defense spend, which I was amazed at um, and questioned it twice with the guys and they, they said that's true. Um, so I found that pretty amazing. So this, um, this takes the, the base element from the, the previous slide and splits it into numerous elements from procurement to research, military personnel. Um, Overall, we see defense spend declining as a percentage of GDP. Um, so fiscal year 9 and 9, 10 approached 10, uh, 5 percent of, of GDP. Uh, we see that declining to around 3 percent um, by uh, 2018. Um, so the investment proportion, the procurement, uh, research, development, um, that was estimated to account for around 28% of the total spend in fiscal 14. And we see that element growing to account for almost a third um, by 2019. Um, overall, in terms of real terms, you can, you can pretty much say that, that spend um, is going to remain relatively flat over the next few years. This um, takes that procurement and research development element from the previous slide and splits it in terms of mission category. Um, so you can see fiscal 15 to 16, there was an increase of around 15% in terms of overall spend from 153 um, billion to 177 billion. Um, the biggest elements of that were aircraft and related systems, shipbuilding and ground systems. 
combined to count for just under 50% of the overall spend. Um, when you add in missiles, um, defense, um, space, and C4I, um, that brings it up to around 65% um, in 2016. The one um, negative area of growth there you'll see is space, space systems, a uh, decline of 1.4% um, in fiscal 16. Um, that was really because there was only um, one satellite funded and I think five launch vehicles funded in fiscal 16. Um, so a low point there, but we do expect that to, to pick up again in, in 2017. The final opportunity and the final sector, uh, transportation. I know this was something that Toby spoke about last year as an area of um, good growth. Um, I think there are still some opportunities here, but I think the, the picture has certainly changed over the last 12 months versus the story that, that Toby talked about. The, the light blue category on the far left of each of, of each of the blocks for each year, that's transportation equipment production as a whole. Um, so we can see that that blue bar still continues to increase out to 2020, but some of the key elements of that um, are telling a different picture. Um, the dotted red line and the, the yellow line um, show a drop in growth in 2016 for both shipbuilding, um, trucks, heavy, uh, heavy duty trucks, uh, and railroad. Um, so that's really been impacted by, the, again, the change in commodity prices. Um, and we've seen that talked about a lot, um, as well as impacting off-highway um, vehicles as well. Companies like Caterpillar and, and JCB have really struggled in, uh, in recent months. The, the dark blue bar in the middle does highlight an area of growth, which is aerospace. Um, so that's relatively flat for the next couple of years, but then suddenly picks up um, 18, 19, and 20. And that's really being driven by investment in commercial airlines um, and increasing, increasing passenger numbers. Um, using those services as well. So an opportunity there. Important to note with this, these aren't, rel these aren't um, actual market sizes. This is all a, a based off an index from, from 2012 to highlight where the growth might come from. So just to, to sum up, um, in the automation space, um, still a challenging environment for machinery production and capex, but with good opportunity to implement new technologies like smart manufacturing and IoT. Defense spend in the US, 1.5% um, CAGR over the coming few years, but with a declining OCO element to that. Um, good opportunity in, in military ground systems, missiles, munitions, and aircraft. Um, 15 to 16, um, we're estimating a 13.6 billion combined increase in spend for those, for those sectors. And if you look at industrial production on the transportation side, the um, marine index, heavy duty vehicles, trucks, and, and rail looking difficult over the next few years, but certainly a, a, an opportunity in, in aerospace. 